We are back with another episode of The Measurables. Yeah, yeah, brother, let's do work. <laughs> and a rudiment pan, good fight sweatshirt. My brother, a lot of you all may not know this guy, but a lot of you all do because you all are educated. Um, this is a good friend of mine. Met him at opening ceremony years ago. And he moved from opening ceremony to American Rag. Then he started his own brand. And his brand is incredible it's called good fight and his name is caleb lynn how are you my brother i'm good man thank you for having me here brother welcome to the podcast this is legit yeah it's, it's, legit. it's, it's it, brother it's too legit to quit you know <laughs> what i'm saying so before we get into anything i always ask people how are you how's your mental how dang Put me on the spot. <laughs> about to get really vulnerable right from the top. <laughs> I don't want you crying in here. I don't no, want... no, no, no. It's good. I mean, it's funny because I feel like, um, you know, I was thinking about how, you know, last time I, we were talking about uh, Jeremy's podcast, Blammo, right? And, uh, you know, he asked me the question. He asked me a really loaded question, which is a really tough one to ask is, are you, are you happy? Mm, wow. And I think I would wow. say that, like, in that moment, um, very honestly, like I very much was, you know, and I would, you know, I was, I was thinking about how like people, when people ask that question, you know, like how you're supposed to answer it. And mm. I guess answering that today, like, how am I doing? Um, it's not that, oh, I'm in a state of depression or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, but I think that I would say that like, I'm doing well, Yeah. but at the same time, like, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things going on. A lot of things going on right now, whether yeah. that's personal, um, business, uh, just in the news. You know, listening to yeah. things like I've been trying to filter the way that I take in my like communication, like read the news and and stuff like that. Like I I deactivated my IG for for a second. Wow. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> which, is that right? For, for 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 the new generation, I know that's like a really big deal, right? Yeah. So, um, but for me, I just I just realized that I needed a moment to kind of back up, um, just because of everything that's hitting us all the time, and I've been trying to figure out ways to slow down. The big thing too for me as well is, you know, I feel like I'm kind of reaching the midpoint point in my life. Yeah. And um, I want to challenge myself. I'm, um, I, I want to be, um, I want to be better. Yeah. You know, like, um, and so one of the big things that I realized that, you know, I was listening to a podcast, um, before Christmas and it was talking about how, you know, social media at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of benefits that it brings us obviously right. very important for like a, from a business point of view. Absolutely. Um, but talking about how like the things that we, feel like that we get from it um the benefits that we get from it some of those things might have already existed before um and the negative things seem to sometimes outweigh the positive things that it actually brings and i i know i found myself sitting at home and you sit down in your in your couch right and hour and a half later you you, you fall into it. Yeah, you, you're gone. You know what I mean? You've just been death scrolling. Well, the thing that's so interesting about what you're saying is I have pot, not, not well, social media can either be a cesspool mm -hmm. or it can be a bridge to heaven. Mm -hmm. It's what you make it. Right. Since it's working on an algorithm, whatever you're liking, whatever you're searching is what the system will take as this is what you want to see. Yeah. So, I always say that when I worked at United Talent, you had access to everything, mm -hmm. good or bad. Right. So if it was your desire to be George Clooney, talking about how, you know, we need to make the world better, mm -hmm. sitting at summits, you know, like if that was your goal, you had access to that. Right. But also if you want to be a piece of shit and fuck around with hookers and snort coke, that was available too. Right. Not necessarily at the agency, but like you had you had access to whatever you wanted. So you right. can go either way. So when you talk about death scrolling, I understand. Like when I'm yeah. when, when when I'm like looking for like motivation or when I'm like looking through my uh my timeline, 
I'm, I'm always interested in the things that pop up. Because, mm-hmm. like, you know, like, I feel for the most part, I, I, I attempt to be as jovial as possible. Mm-hmm. But, like, you know, anything that's too dark, I'm just like, ugh. Mm-hmm. Because those things attach themselves to your subconscious. Right. And once they do that, bro, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, everybody knows that you are a son of New York. <laughs> yeah. At least they should. Yeah. Um, how did your family influence your business mindset or did they at all? Uh, man, I think they did in a funny way. How so? Um, I mean, so my father actually, um, I think some people know this, some people don't. Um, uh, both my parents are pastors now, but my dad originally was, uh, he owned uh, an accessories business in New York City. What type of accessories? Um, like pins, jewelry, different kinds of things like that yeah. uh, for men and women. Like tchotchkes. Tchotchkes, um, stuff you would sell to like J.C. Penney's, Macy's, yeah. Army, Navy. Wow. Um, I got to travel the country a little bit with him when he was doing shows for that. But that's that's originally what he what he used to do. Yeah. His office was on. His office was on Forty Fourth. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, he he did that. Um, for a long time before he sold the business and we came to California. Wow. So, and then before that, actually, my, um, on my mom's side, my grandfather originally, he had um, a general store. He had a few general stores. This uh, is in New York. In New York City. In yeah. New York City. Yeah. And he had a few. And essentially, what happened was um, that's the business my, that my dad took over. So, my grandfather started a general store as a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of, uh, Asian immigrants would would do things like that in New York City. Mm-hmm. My uh, grandma had the foresight to actually shift that into a wholesale, where they started Word, to uh, import different kinds of jewelry and things like that, repackage it, make different kinds of selections. Essentially, kind of what a lot of brands or a lot now. of a lot of companies already do. People mm-hmm. just don't know about. Right. Kind of white label. Yeah. Um, and then sell to the department stores all over the U.S. Wow. So she was doing that. Um, and that's how she transformed Yen Associates into what it was. And then eventually my father took over that business. So were you young working in the store, like on the weekends during the summer? Like was like, were, was your family like imputing into you? Like what you're seeing, like me packaging this up? No, no. Like, like you weren't getting any of that game. No. Well, okay. So I did sometimes I was helping with the family sometimes with like the packaging and everything like that. Um, you know, just as like, you know, you're, you're a young immigrant family, you're going to help out the family business in some yeah, way, you know, when they absolutely. need it. So, but the, the general store thing had, was already gone by the time that I was born. So they were fully into the wholesale aspect of the business and way be, more lucrative, way more lucrative. But, but at the end of the day too, like both my parents went to Columbia. So yeah. that's awesome bro yeah it's, it's, it's a blessing it's a blessing yeah. my mom moved to queens when she was 10 so she's from taipei originally she moved to queens when she was 10 my dad moved to the city to go to columbia for college yeah um he's quite a bit older than her so they they actually ironically didn't cross over but they actually ended up going to the same school and then wow. he was so he was in columbia for chemical engineering but was actually in the phd program uh, once he graduated for English literature, that's his true passion. Wow, English literature. English literature. So is he so, like a poet? Is he like kicking sonnets to mom? Well, he's a pastor, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know but, I mean? but 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 my question always is like pastors are some of the most eloquent yeah. speakers. Yeah. So like yeah. What, what, like like was he like you know like writing a note for your mom and like leaving it on the you know like leaving it on the that's Leave it on the dresser question. drawer. You know, I've never asked that. I feel that probably comes from a lot of children's like innate fear of learning anything about their parents' romance. <laughs> <laughs> and just wanting to, you know, like you, you're like respect. Oh you know God. what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm glad that that happened because I wouldn't be here otherwise. But right. you try not to think about that stuff too much. Correct. But my mom always says my dad's romantic. Yeah. My mom's not really into stuff like that. Wow. I think he asked uh, her to marry him on a subway in New York. No, that's not romantic. That's not romantic, romantic at all. I think it is in our eyes, hearing it as Californians, like that's the most New York shit that could ever happen. Absolutely, yeah. But not incredibly romantic. Nah. Yeah. So, but but my dad has a passion for literature, and that's that's what he was originally trying to do. Actually, the reason why he came to the U.S. So he grew up in Taipei, and all of his brothers 
do really interesting things is um, my oldest uncle ended up coming to the U.S. very early on, moving down to Laguna Niguel when it was all still farmland. Wow. And so he's an orange farmer. And um, he's retired now, but he's um, he actually engineered these really special oranges that they have in Southern California. And, Are you serious? Yeah. And then my uh, my my dad's uh, younger brother ended up becoming a doctor, and he moved down to D.C. And in the summertime, we used to always go down to D.C. I never realized why. Turns so he was out, around all black people all the time. <laughs> yeah, Queens. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, it was the Upper West Side, so it was kind of. I grew up in the Upper West Side, so okay. in in a in an admittedly pretty bougie area. So it was a mix of Jewish people, Puerto Rican people, black people. Mm-hmm. You know that whole mix because we were right up right up next to Harlem. Yeah, and so growing up, were you into fashion at all? I don't think so. So no. when did so so when does like when does fashion come into the picture? And that's a two part question because I want to know. Did New York inform your fashion mm-hmm. love or was it Los Angeles or like what was it? Man, the funny thing is I feel like nobody's ever really asked me that before. And and, and, and I feel like I can I can kind of chart it back. Like I think I've always been into, you know, obviously like you can, you know, just talking about my parents. I think my mom's always been um, so she she was a chemical engineer. Or she she studied to be a chemical engineer because mm-hmm. it was the hardest uh, the hardest major at school. That's why she picked wow. it. <laughs> wow! She actually got into MIT too, but she wanted to stay in the city. She didn't she didn't want to be. She didn't want to go to Massachusetts. Yeah, exactly. Right. So and then, but my dad obviously like the reason that he moved to the U.S. was he loved American culture. He loved to he would play hooky from school and he'd go watch gangster movies. So like very early on, when I was a kid. When my mom wasn't around, my dad was introducing me to movies like Goodfellas and The Godfather and all of that stuff. And my uncle used to tell me stories about how my dad used to um, skip out on school and go to the movies and dress up in a pinstripe suit. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that maybe wow, like all in. that that kind of love for art and aesthetics and stuff like that comes from him. Probably comes from my dad. That being said, like my dad is kind of your classic new yorker where i feel like i feel like your classic new yorker like does care about aesthetics to a certain extent but but carries cares about function a lot more absolutely he wears a yankees cap an oxford shirt khakis and a pair of black kicks like every single day hey bro <laughs> good fight 2023 yeah yeah i go. mean the ivy prep you know obviously yeah. like you know he, he he has that heritage yeah um but wow wow wow, wow. so Prior to starting the brand, mm-hmm. what line of work were you into? So when I came out of college, um, you know, I was a sociology major, uh, mainly because I was trying to graduate. I didn't Absolutely. know what I wanted to do. I was yeah, let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I wanted yeah. to do something creative. Um, I didn't know what what it was. My best friend was going to USC with uh, uh, one of my uh, close friends now, Johan mm-hmm. from Three Sixteen. Yep. And um, I was like, look, like, I don't know what I want to do. I want to try something creative. And Johan ended up uh, hiring me as an intern and said, you can intern for us here at 316. So I worked for him and Andrew Chen. Um, and then you can work uh, full time at this little streetwear boutique called El Mercado on Pico. Um, Pico and Hauser. Wow, wow, wow. And that was like my first start right out of college. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't really sure exactly it it wasn't necessarily that when i came out of college i was like oh i want to do fashion but i knew that i wanted to try something creative i liked what 316 was doing at the time they were just making t-shirts and stuff Mm -hmm. they were making like the 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 martin luther king t-shirts and things like that and i loved how they were engaging with the culture in terms of i think representing what they believe but at the same time communicating it with aesthetics you talked about culture. So you like jumped ahead of my <laughs> questionnaire. Yeah. But, 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 but as a man of Asian descent, yeah. Asian culture is alluring and deep in many ways. Uh-huh. What do you feel your place in culture is as an American? Yeah. As a man and as an, as a designer. Yeah. In the fashion landscape. Yeah. Um, ooh. Let me start out 
real quick also by saying that I, I'm not the designer of Good Fight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I but mean, you offer, but you offer insight. I do, I do. Uh, I yeah. have an amazing team. We started the brand with my friends, um, uh, my wife Christina Chow, who runs business strategy, Calvin, who's our designer, and then Julia, uh, who's our creative director. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, um, a lot about where I come from and who I am does inform uh, why we started the brand in the first place. Absolutely. Um, I think I grew up very confused about my identity, hmm. especially growing up in New York, uh, which is ironic because that's supposed to be the melting pot of the world, right? Right. But um, I think growing up in New York is is tough. I, I, I think anybody will tell you that. Mm-hmm. I mean, growing up anywhere, I think, is, is a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, New York, especially because I think you you're you you are pressed at an early age um, to find your tribe, you know. And, Absolutely. Um, and I think especially I would say with the Asian population, um, we a lot of times feel a lot of pressure to um, almost like. Uh, find our oh, what's the word it's uh almost kind of like blend in you know mm. assimilate in a way to take on to, to try to find legitimacy in, in because i think because of a lot of classic american stigmas that usually view asian people as weak or as mm. not cool and like different docile things like that. and all that yeah so yeah. you feel like either you have guys that embrace uh black culture uh, mm-hmm. You have guys that become very white, you know, um, and so uh, and and it's hard sometimes I think to try to figure out like where you where your identity is. Mm-hmm. So I think I grew up pretty confused about like okay like yeah, um, I'm Asian American. Does that does that term even exist? A lot of people complain that that term actually shouldn't exist. That it's trying wow. to put Asian people into a into a monolith is wow. way too confusing because there's so many different kinds. Yeah. Um, which I think is a fair argument. But um, I think as I grew older, and I would say it's even more recent in in the realization and the journey is I feel like that I had uh, the blessing to be born as somebody that's able to walk between worlds. Yes. I will say... There is, um, you know, Dowie. Yeah. And you are like the most like culturally seasoned Asian gentleman I know. <laughs> so when I, when, 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 when I think about Asian people mm. that I've seen in the media, mm. it was always like long duck dong and mm-hmm. 16 can. I mean, like yeah. just really degrading shit. Right. You know what I mean? Like right. none of that is, is cool. But the thing is like, it's a part of this Hallmark film that like America has come to know and embrace. But like when you actually get out in the world, there are places, and and I'll take Asian people out of it for a minute. Mm -hmm. There are places where black people are not. Mm -hmm. And the only place that we are is on that tube. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing something about black people being killers, gangsters, Mm -hmm. you know, dead be dead, even, even, like there, there, there's no local representative there to show you like, Mm -hmm. no, we're actually just getting up just like you are. Right. We're working every day. Mm-hmm. We want the same thing for our children that you want for yours. Yeah. Education, good job, law-abiding citizen. Yeah. When you don't see that, you know, like, and you get to schools where you're, like, one of very few, and then you have people around you who have looked at TV and they feel that that's how you should act. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of people, unfortunately, yeah, fall into that, like, well, I guess I'm supposed to be gangster. I right. guess I'm supposed to. And, and when you say that, you had a problem with identity. Mm-hmm. How did you grab the horse and say, you know what? No, 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 no. Your vision of what an Asian person is, mm-hmm. that's your vision. But like, this is who I am. How, right. Like, like what, what, what led to that? Like becoming who you are? Yeah. Um, I think, like I said, like, um, that's one of the things that I was able to discover. Um, actually, I feel like fashion actually really helped me find that Hmm. um i remember the first time um you know i was telling jeremy this i was like i remember the first time i tried on like a jacket from jenny watanabe 
and it was it, it was like i think it was i think it was a, a barber collaboration that he did mm -hmm. and re i remember putting that jacket on and being like this jacket fits me perfectly yeah and yeah growing up i just never had that you know mm -hmm. the sizing is always a little bit off for me my body type's a little bit different too even as an asian like i'm more athletic so i'm right. i'm a little bit thicker Right. So right. Um, I've always had a problem necessarily fitting into like standard clothing. But I remember the first time that I put on um, clothing from like independent brands like Junya or Lad Musician or Nam de Guerre and stuff like that. And putting that on for the first time and being like, whoa, I don't have to wear what everybody else wears. I don't have to just see somebody out there and be like, well, maybe I need to dress like that. I can actually find my own way. Right. And that I think was very eye opening. Um even in an emphasis of like, okay, even specific, specifically for the junior stuff, like I don't need to also try to imitate Japanese fashion to find my path or to find my own identity. You know, like mm -hmm. I am who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm Asian American, right? And, and what that means, <laughs> again, I use that term, I think, uh, lightly because there's so much different kinds of nuance that comes into that. On, again, whether or not even that term should even be a term. Hmm. Um, but one of the things I know is that like when I'm in Asia, I'm not considered, if I go back to Taiwan, I'm not considered Taiwanese. Taiwanese. Um, wow. I'm considered American. But when I'm in America, You're not considered. I'm not considered American. You know? And and I used wow. to hate that. I used to hate that. Or when I used to, when I used to hoop, um, when I used to um, go to different places, if they treated me a certain way because of the way that I look or had certain types of expectations, you know, I used to resent that a lot, you know, but I think as I've grown older, one, I've realized, um, you know, everybody is trying to operate from to the best of their understanding that you have to give a certain grace in order oh, to move, absolutely. move forward in life. But yes. the other thing too is that like, I feel like uh, I was given a blessing to be able to um, experience things and grow up in things from both cultures and that's part of the reason why we started good fight was because we felt like um we wanted to see more representation um for people in our space and right. and, that, and that's not just asian american we've never called ourselves an asian american brand we've mm. always thought of ourselves as a bridge uh we've always said at good fight that we believe uh in true art and the power of human value. Awesome. And, go ahead. Well, what is the what's the origin of the name? What does it mean? Like uh, a good fight is like if you underestimate me, this good fight, I'm mm -hmm. gonna come out victorious, but I'm gonna <laughs> whoop your ass. Like, what does it mean? I think it means standing up for what's right. Yeah. Even I think especially when the odds are stacked against you. The mm. last day the last day uh of my time at American Rag was November eleventh, twenty sixteen. Yeah. The day of the election. Hmm. I'll never forget that day. Why? Because kind of, the, it, I think it was a classic example. And I, I, and I don't hate that day because it's part of history. And part of life is also, I think, um, not just uh, complaining about the things that happened, but living it through and seeing what you do with it. Absolutely. Bro. And I and I remember Bye my on. my mom calling me and being like, "Hey, like, are you sure that this is a good time to start a brand right now? You know, like, <laughs> you know, we're, we're the economy's not looking so good. Yeah. Uh, politics are crazy right now." And I remember telling my mom, "I was like, that's exactly why we're starting the brand mm. um, because we felt like everything that was going on in the country um, kind of symbolized." Uh, it wasn't just politics. It was an avatar for what was going on in society. Mm. And I think society was getting to a point, um, and, it, and it wasn't, honestly, it's not just about the far right, but I think it was about people in general, where it felt like we were getting so used to success. We we're getting used to, the world was becoming smaller. Everything was at our fingertips, right? You Everything. think about this, Everything. you know, 2016, you know, even or right, right before the pandemic, think about how the world was before the pandemic so many things were coming to us and everything was becoming so fast. And um, it felt like what the world was saying was, it doesn't matter how you win as long as you win. Mm. And that all it was about was winning. Right. And what we always tell people is, well, we just don't fucking believe that. Right. We don't. Word. 
we've always believed that it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. The journey. And not only that, like we've always believed that what we do with art, what we do with fashion is not about product. It's about people. Mm. But the clothes look real good on people. They look great. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, they look fantastic. But the reason is because the reason is because we believe we believe that there's power in that. Mm-hmm. We believe that there's power in when you put something on and you feel like a m- million bucks or you feel like something represents you. You know? <laughs> you look good in that. But Thank you, brother. Yeah, but you look good in that in, in, in the Warrior sweatshirt too. Yeah, but I mean I mean good fight, bro. Good fight. Good fight. Yeah, but that's that's you know, like I think that so from that value, but also I think from the basic value of um also like how are you doing your business? Okay. Mm. Like so one of the reasons we started the brand was because all of us up until that point had already been involved in the business for over a decade right wow. our partners right wow. so we didn't just come out of nowhere and be like well we want to start a brand we we had a lot of experience in different areas obviously you know like like i was a buyer mm-hmm. julia was a stylist who also was a buyer before too calvin uh was the one that went to fashion school right christina still works uh full-time as an agent yeah. at caa yeah um and one of the things that we realized though was this industry is so vast and this industry uh, likes to posture so much and stand for so many different kinds of things. But how many times have we been involved in different kinds of fashion things where they didn't treat people right? When you say we, are yeah. you talking about Asian people or are you talking about no. people in general? People in general, people in fashion in general. Right. Like where you have some company is awesome and they put out a wonderful T-shirt that stands for this, that stands for empowerment or X, Y, Z, but they treat their employees like shit or they don't, pay people on time right or they're constantly their their business is in a mess mm-hmm. you know and know a lot of those type of companies. <laughs> we know a lot of those type know of companies and that's yeah. the big thing that of what we were trying to stand for as well like we're like i said like we're not in good fights not an asian american brand it's also not a social justice brand mm-hmm. but we believe in excellence by doing good we believe in excellence through integrity through mm kindness Mm. and we think that that's worth it and that's we think that it's worth fighting for and we think that that's worth sometimes sacrificing for because that means sometimes i gotta pay a little bit more because i want to work with this factory you gotta pay more you know (laughs) listen listen yeah i always tell people because i deal with all different types of people socioeconomically right Mm -hmm. and you'd be surprised the higher the people up on the ladder sometimes financially the cheaper they are right. because they're so used to getting stuff for free. Right. So there was a time, I've been in business 20 years, right, mm-hmm. where I was constantly cowering to that. Right. Like, how much is the suit? And this is when suits were like 2500 Right. Oh, man, I can go somewhere and get it for $17. i would be like, oh, well, you know what? I, I can do it for 18 Right. Because I was just like, let me just get the business. Mm-hmm. But you come to a point where you're like, no, I'm putting in the work. Yeah. And not only am I making this garment for you, People don't complain at a discounted rate, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So if something is wrong, they're not looking at it like, you know what? Well, he did discount it for me. Let me just have a little, let let, let, let me be gracious. No, they're Mm -hmm. complaining like they pay full price. Right. So if you're going to complain like you pay full price, you're Mm -hmm. going to pay full price. (laughs) Yeah. So I got to that point where I was like, you know what? This person may may bring, you know, $100,000 to my bottom line, but they're bringing me a million dollars worth of headache. Yeah. Not worth it. And it's not worth it. Yeah. And you also like people have to understand there's a saying like the uh, the the I, and I, I hope I'm saying this correctly. The 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 good taste of a discount will be long forgotten after people realize what a crappy product you have. Mm-hmm. Like they'll forget about that. Yeah. And the thing is, the reason why I admire you and admire the brand is because it's just like this is what it is. Mm-hmm. We're making quality garments making them locally. Yeah. You got to pay people a livable wage. Yeah. And that is non-negotiable. Right. And what's interesting, Caleb, is that the people who are buying it, who are asking for a discount, mm-hmm. based on what they do, mm. if you would ask them, you know, like, based on what you do, can I come get a discount? They'd mm-hmm. be like, no. Yeah. So it's no different. Right. Right. No different. So yeah. I, I, I wanted to jump to something real quick. Do you consider Good Fight a New York brand, an L.A. brand? Mm-hmm. What we, do you consider it? We consider it an LA brand. We consider it because mm. we're we're from all over the place. Um, right. You know, I'm from New York. 
Um, uh, Calvin's from New Orleans, grew up mm-hmm. in Singapore. Uh, Christina's from Chicago. Uh, and actually, uh, Julie is from LA. So we are all from all different places, but we met here. We started the brand here. We incorporated here. We make our clothes here. Um, and and this is home for, for all four of us. So yeah, this we definitely consider it a Los Angeles brand. And that, oh. that comes with a lot of different stigmas. Hmm. Um, but we've, we've decided to embrace that. Absolutely. Yeah. So how long did it take for the brand to gain its legs financially, visually? Well, we're still gaining our legs financially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, You're an independent. So. We're an independent. Yeah. No, but we're still here. So that's a blessing. It's been five years now. We just celebrated our five year anniversary um, with a collection that we did uh, for Dover Street Market. Um, nice. We, uh, when we first started the brand, we didn't know that we want to do fashion at first. So we, we, we put out our f- initial collection. Um, we did a small showroom in New York City and in Chinatown for a few friends and press. We thought that we want to go DTC. So like I came from a background as a buyer and I was like, I don't want to wholesale my stuff. Right. right? right. I want to, if we can go direct to consumer right off the bat, like that is my goal. But you know, it's hard to do that without you have any a kind of attention. Yeah. You have to have a hybrid. And you need to have some form of legitimacy. Like if, if you're able to do that, blessings. Right. But, um, you know, even a store like or even a, a brand like uh, a Noah, you know, obviously they have they had people had to have that reference point for Brendan, Brendan coming from Supreme um, or also with the different partnerships that he had or with Chris and, and Union right. and stuff like that, right. too. Right. Um, you know, for us, you know, we were coming out of nowhere. And what happened that season was um, Julia used to work for an amazing stylist, her name's Karen Kaiser, who's still a good friend of the brand. Mm-hmm. She had sent our lookbook over to the head of PR at Comme des Garçons, um, Say uh, Daphne word. Sabold, who's at Sky High Farms now. She's amazing. And she had sent the lookbook over to the buyers at Dover, New York. So we were very fortunate when we were blasting out of press and everything like that. We had just gone back to New York. We had flown back from the showroom we had gone back to new york because vogue wanted to see the collection mm-hmm. so we flew all the way back just to go to conde nast show them the collection and then we flew back wow and then um we got an email from the buyers at dover saying hey we'd be interested to check out the collection and we were like absolutely we can be back there right and they were like oh you guys are already back in la and uh, we were like, yeah. And they were like, well, that's okay. Don't worry about it. We're not going to make you fly all the way back over here. But we'll see you next season in Paris. And I remember. Like, no, 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 no. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> we're like, wait, I'm wait, out, wait, no, wait, no, wait. No, no, I'm coming right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm seven so, hours away. But but we didn't. Wow. We didn't. Mm-hmm. We, we we paused because we felt like we were maybe being a little bit too, too thirsty. Mm, and the next season, we took the brand to Paris for the first time to wholesale for the first time mm-hmm. and true to their word um they pulled up dover came out um they uh they came out uh with a few of their international buyers and we also saw essence we saw the guys from road and gray as well um and then we left that paris um and uh we didn't hear from anybody for a few months mm-hmm. and i remember sitting at the table with my good friends and we were talking about um we were talking about um like vision and like why we do what we do right and he uh one of his close friends had just uh committed suicide oh wow. so he was like why do you guys do what you do wow and i remember sitting there telling him about what the brand represented why we started it and how i was like look not everything's always going our way we went we we made the investment to to go to paris and we saw all these people. We didn't see nobody. Oh, we 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 don't we didn't hear back from nobody. Um, but we still believe in what we do. Right. And um, the moment I said that, my phone flashed, and it was an email from uh, the buyers at Dover saying, "Apologies for for the delay. Right. We're really happy to start working with you. And here's your first order. And so that was our first order. Wow. Yeah. Wow, so wow, that wow. was, that was kind of our start to kind of like jump into the fray right out the gate. Um, Hold on, wait, wait, we got to clap it up for that. <laughs> we got to clap it up for that, bro. Come on, man. 
Come on, man. That's amazing. The thing is this. You never know how God is working. Mm -hmm. And if the quickest way to make Jesus or God laugh is Mm -hmm. show him your plan. Yeah. Like, bro, I got you. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So, So do you, what was the first piece that like the brand created and sold well? And do you remember, like, you yeah. know, like, yeah. I, I know that Dover do. was the first sale. Right. But, like, what was that? Was it a piece or was it pieces um, that, like, went? I mean, so, first of all, I, I want to shout out Marissa, who's who's no longer at Dover, but she she was the buyer that we first worked with who was really there for us and I think really shepherded us, you know, when we first started out as a brand. And mm-hmm. working with that initial team, her, um, Ari, Eileen, Maddie, um, all these guys, like it was so awesome because it it's the, one of the best stores in the world. Um, but it felt like working with like a mom and pop, and they really communicated wow. really well with us, took care of us. Daphne, our first season when we first launched uh, Fall Winter eighteen undertones, had us fly out to New York. We did uh, a clinic with uh, the, staff. The, st- the staff, and then she sent us to desk visits. To every single major publication in New York City, Wall Street Journal, Esquire, GQ. Are you serious, everybody. bro? Yeah, people so, pay for that, bro. Like I can't, <laughs> I can't put into words how much of a blessing that was, and how they really take care of. Like if you start with them, I mean, that's I don't know how it, you know how it is now, uh, but for us at that time, when you start with them, they really, they really try to champion you because they mm-hmm. they believe in you. Well, they're vested. Yeah, exactly. But we're such a tiny brand, you know, it's not like our PO is giant, but at the same time, so going back to the question that you asked, that collection, um, in a lot of ways, actually the collection that we're working on right now, um, that we're about to bring to Paris for Fall Winter 23, um, it's not a revisiting of that Undertones collection, but I think it's trying to rediscover the spirit mm-hmm. that we had when we first started. Yeah. Um, and if we narrowed it down to a piece, there was a satin bowler shirt that we did that season called the Venus Bowler, mm. which um I think is probably been like our probably most recognizable piece that has the has the blossoms of a Venus flytrap mm. embroidered on the two sides of the shirt. A lot of people don't realize it's actually two different it's not a reflection, they're two separate artworks. Wow. And it's embroidered um with this machine that has to be held by hand because the embroidery is so intricate and it's done wow. in japan so oh. that the fabric doesn't pucker it's um a really hard piece to make it's a really beautiful piece to make mm-hmm. we were really really blessed to have some amazing partners in japan that helped us develop um, that shirt and other pieces in that collection and that wow. collection did amazing i think we had probably like an 80 to 90 percent pre-markdown sell through that for is that fan- bro for those who don't know what he just said that is fantastic. <laughs> Do your research. <laughs> Understand what he's saying. He's dropping gems. <laughs> so in reference to, uh, you're talking about five years, right? Yeah. Do you all plan on doing any retrospective of going back into the archives? We had this conversation. We yeah. Went to dinner. At dinner, yeah. You and Josh. Do you, like, do you all want to go back into the archives and pull out those, you know, those gunners? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think, and shout out to Kissy. Much love to that man. Shout out to Joshua, <laughs> brother. And, um, but uh, we had a chance to start doing that with the five-year collection that we did. Mm-hmm. That was amazing to go back to look at some of like the successful pieces that have been really strong for us. Absolutely. Um, yes. And um, definitely like that's that's a point of emphasis for us in terms of looking at some of the old silhouettes that people really, really love. Um, And then also, I think, digging back into, I think, um, like I was telling you at dinner, I think development for this season was especially hard, not because of the product aspect of it, but because I think we did a lot of soul searching this season. Mm. We did a lot of, uh, we spent a lot of time, we've typically always done kind of like thematic collections that Mm -hmm. are based on um, different kinds of inspirations. Mm -hmm. And this season we wanted and it sounds a little bit narcissistic but we wanted ourselves to be the the insp- the inspiration and the drive now pause yeah this is why i said to you because you said earlier i'm not the designer mm-hmm. okay be that as it may but you have like when people think of good fight 
they think of you. They mm-hmm. think of, you know, your wife. They, they think of, like, the collective because mm-hmm. you all, all work hand in hand. In yeah. it. So, like, do you ever look at the collection that is, like, being proposed and say, well, that would be dope if we did this? Mm-hmm. Or is it just, like, you just give total autonomy? No, we definitely wrestle with each other. Um, I think me, Calvin, and Julia work very closely together on the designs. Um, I do, I try to do a lot to give them um as much autonomy uh mm-hmm. or a last say as as they as they as they as i can right um you know a lot of a lot of my input a lot of times has to do with like how much the fabric costs or um real questions history. by the way real questions <laughs> yeah. yeah real questions selling history on silhouettes how we perform in certain categories so kind of like bringing in some of my experience as a buyer um, and then also, I think trying to be that centering force in terms of being like, is this speaking to what we're trying to do in the spirit of the brand? Even though the styles change, even though the inspo changes, does this still feel like this is us? And, and, and I think the good thing, too, is that Calvin and Julia both understand that as well. They're always thinking about that as well, too. So we work pretty closely together on the designs. Um, but at the end of the day, like it's, it, you know, 90% of the creative is, is coming out of those guys. Wow. Yeah. So, so I want to talk about culture and messaging, mm-hmm. right? So when African Americans speak about culture, it's largely based on all the contributions that we've done. Mm-hmm. All things from Egypt to La Brea, right? right? <laughs> it's all our forms that we created. Yeah. Right. So Good Fight is extremely original mm-hmm. in its messaging. Mm. How did the brand just fine tune that messaging. Mm. Um, this is a question that you've had to have been asked before. No, you ask good questions, boss. I mean, hey, bro. Yeah, I was an English major, bro. <laughs> Come on. Nobody's ever asked that before. That's a really good question. I mean, I think one of the things is that when we first started, the reason we came together was because we had shared values. Absolutely. I think yes. we are all so different, and that's what makes the brand complicated at times. Mm-hmm. And that is our big challenge in terms of, I think, trying to bring all those different perspectives together yes. and put it into kind of a cohesive narrative. But in terms of like our core values, they're the same. They're they're very, very much the same. Wow, so yeah. I think like in terms of our beliefs, in terms of like how to treat people, in terms of our um, kind of desire for a certain kind of quality level, in terms of like the kind of product that we're making, it's the same. I think the great thing is that, like, I met Calvin and Julia working together at opening ceremony. So when uh, we met was around the time of when I met them. And we mm-hmm. all uh, shared that kind of, like, professional experience together. So we have that expectation in terms of understanding, like, what to expect from each other of mm-hmm. taste um, in terms of even funny thing is, like, now coming back where we've opened a shop. Also, even in terms of from a retail level because we share so much background together, yeah. the expectation is very, very similar. Mm-hmm. So also, like, I know 100% any of us are in the shop. I know the customers are going to be taken care of the right way. And I know when this year we're planning to hire um, some shop kids that will, I know how we're going to be training them. We're all right, on the same page in, in terms right. of that way. Yeah, for those who don't know, uh, right, it's adjacent to Filipino town. Or yeah. is it in Filipino town? I guess it's technically in historic Filipino town on, on, uh, on Beverly and Union. And it is like the feng shui of the <laughs> office is, is is ever changing. It's always changing. But the upstairs yeah. is a revelation in terms of just like just how it's laid out. Everything like I, I always tell my sons this. Everything has a place. Mm-hmm. And since I'm saying it to them, they already know that something is out of place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I go to your office, like everything is just it's just in yeah. order. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. Kudos to you for that. Yeah, maybe that's our Asian side kind of coming out a little yeah. bit. <laughs> and, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that, brother. Order is the foundation of everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And so is education. Yeah. So you talked about 2016 as the watershed moment, right? Mm-hmm. But how did COVID affect your business mm. in terms of, you know, did you level set during that time? Like, Yeah. Um, COVID was a really important time. Because we're um, still in it, by the way. Yeah, we're not out of it. The funny yeah. thing is, like, yeah. we always talk about it like we're out of it. We're not. Um, mm-hmm. Or I think also, yeah, maybe we never will be. It's kind of part of our reality now. Right. Um, when COVID started, you know, I feel like the, the biggest thing, there's a lot of things we learned from COVID, right? The big question 
in 2023 is how have we brought that forward? That's the, actually, that's the big question with 2022. Right. Everybody had different dreams about what they wanted to accomplish. Not only that, but also like how they were going to take the things that they experienced from 2020 and 2021. And I would say that the vast majority of people that I talked to probably aren't exactly happy with the way that 2022 went. Or even the way, from a personal perspective, in Correct. terms of like, Correct. Did I did I really take the things that I learned during that time and apply it to my life, or did did I become complacent and did I did I return to my old ways? And that's the challenge of twenty twenty three, you know. Wow. And I think that that's also wow. the challenge of like becoming a more seasoned human being, you know. Like, if you want to talk from a biblical perspective, that's why um, storytelling is such a huge important aspect uh, in terms of um, even like religious society right of even um the jewish people used to take the scriptures and they'd write it on pieces of paper and put it into a box and literally bind it to their foreheads mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. because we forget we forget all the yeah. time and when, yeah. and we're seeing that shit in real time now right we always or, laugh uh, at those stories like oh they saw they saw a uh, 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 fire by night and a cloud in the day how could they think that god wasn't there for them and then we turn around and what BLM happens, right? Mm -hmm. And then we turn around and 2022's status quo. Yeah, man. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always say with a lot of um, companies that did those uh, those African-American hirings um, and, 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 and those people of color hirings, right. a, lot of those, a, a, a lot of those people, unfortunately, don't find themselves employed because the experiment mm -hmm. is over. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, oh, yeah, you know, we felt bad then and uh, all right, we, we, we're on to the next. Yeah. Whereas, like, there's a movie called The Spook That Sat By The Door. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty much about this black man who works for the FBI, learns all of their, the different things that they do to destabilize things, and he goes back and he uses it against them. All right. I'm not saying that you should use anything against anybody, but <laughs> yeah. what you should do is if, you're, if, if you gain access to the VIP section, mm -hmm. you need to see what they're doing in the VIP section mm -hmm. and what makes the VIP section the VIP section. Right. And then come back and figure out how you can make your own VIP section. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that I appreciate about Jewish people, mm -hmm. about Asian people, by and large, like many other groups besides black, is that it's like the ability to pull mm. and not just like get to a certain point and say, you know what? Well, I got mine. Mm -hmm. And like knowing that you can make change happen for so many other people just, what, just, just, just with the yeah the movement of a pen yeah but you're like nah mm -hmm. i'm not gonna do that mm -hmm. that's what i don't like that that that's what i think was so powerful and i i feel like that's what a lot of people miss about what virgil was doing now a, a, a lot of people have dif different opinions on whether you like his design or whether you don't like his design et cetera, et cetera. but the one thing i think that shook me about virgil and and you know you know rest in peace you know obviously for him and, and everything that his family had to go through. Um, the one thing that really shook me is that I feel like what Virgil was doing was it wasn't just, oh, if I can do it, you can do it too. Let me show you. But literally also what he was doing was exactly what you were talking about. He got his foot in the door in terms of high fashion, the old fashioned houses, a kind of like coterie that kind of establishes the narrative in terms of what defines culture? Mm -hmm. What is high end? What is high class? What's considered a value? Why is speaking a certain way considered more high class and speaking a certain way more considered your street? Correct. What does that mean, right? And what mm -hmm. Virgil was doing was it wasn't just look at me, I'm a black designer, a black designer can be in this space too. He was what he if you look at what he was doing and it, and it goes all the way back to when he was still doing the um, the radio show with Lupe and he oh, was talking wow. about how he was trying to <laughs> when he was trying to imagine um what uh Ivy Prep looked like um mm -hmm. in in Chicago in Black right. Ivy right. you know and what he was doing if you saw like those last videos that he was doing with with Riza with Lupe with those yeah. guys and the music and the iconography and the castings he was trying to say, you say this is high class. You say Versailles is high class. You say that this skin tone 
is high class. You say that this culture, European or Western culture, is high class. He said, he was saying, the art that comes from where I come from, where we come from, mm. it holds just as much value. Equally as impressive, if not more. Exactly. And and it's about cherishing that as well and saying that this, I'll put, I will put, I'll put Riza up next to Beethoven. Correct. You know what I mean? Which sounds which which sounds on its head, according to our original perspectives, silly. Mm-hmm. But is it? No, not at all. And it, and it's all about how we consider what's value and who is establishing the status quo. And that's that's the perspective that he was changing is he was trying to introduce those things, not to just be like, this is my version. He's saying, I'm I'm not just saying you can have value if you can come into this position, if you become the uh, uh, creative director or art director uh, of Louis Vuitton. Mm -hmm. He was saying, no, no, no. I'm taking the energy that you have here, exactly what you talked about in terms of the VIP room. I'm mm -hmm. taking this energy in terms of this dictating what is valuable and what is special. And I am giving it or I am, I'm not giving it because it already, it was already there, but mm -hmm. I'm letting you recognize now yeah. that that value is there. He you categorized know? it. That, that Illmatic, that To Pimp a Butterfly, mm -hmm. that uh, Marvin Gaye, mm -hmm. that, Sam Cooke, mm -hmm. that, you know, all these people, we could go on and on. Talk your shit, bro. <laughs> like yeah. that all these people, yeah, yeah. Um, they have value. Um, Absolutely. Just yeah. as much that should be understood, that should be consumed on the Pantheon, on the same level as these other guys. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was doing. He was literally changing our perspectives to be like, oh, no, oh it that, is. that's valuable too. And so when when he passed, I was like, damn. Who's going to do that now? Like, who's going to lead the charge? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, like, it is up to us. <laughs> so, <laughs> you so, know? So, so I want to jump in real quick. Hulu, mm -hmm. Netflix, Prime, you all should do a case study mm. on the relationship between Kanye West mm -hmm. and Virgil mm. and understand why one succeeded one way and why one, you know, I mean, he's, he, I mean, yay succeeded too. He's just kind of on his own thing. Mm -hmm. I always tell people mm -hmm. that Virgil w was what Sidney Poitier was to Hollywood. Mm. He was that to fashion. Yeah. That's what made him so effective because he was able to listen to the street, listen mm -hmm. to the hood. Yeah. And he compared it back to white folks mm -hmm. to where they understood it. Right. And they weren't threatened by it. Mm. Right. Yeah. That's an amazing talent to have. Right. And I was talking to, uh, you know, Joshua about this kissy. Yeah. He was telling me that the tribe that Virgil was from, they're always known for just doing mystical things. Whoa. Pulling off impossible feats. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. Shout out kissy, man. Yeah. Shout out kissy. That's it. I mean, like, I so, so I mean, like, like, like that would be such an incredible case study mm -hmm. for just, I mean, just, just, just see how like he literally was right. the Sidney Poitier of fashion. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's only one Sidney. Yeah. True. There's a Denzel. Mm -hmm. There's only going to be <laughs> one Sidney. Right. So that being said, do you have a dream client, dream company that you would want to work with? Dream client, dream company we want to work with. Um, Cause we are coming to the end, my brother. We're seven minutes out, bro. Yeah. <laughs> we've, been, we, we've been cooking for a, for a strong hour. Yeah. Um. I think that you know, prime client. I mean, obviously, like we're constantly doing studies in internally about like who we think like our our prime client is, or or who who is the person that's buying our clothes right. or the things that we make. Um. I mean, I want to take it back to. I remember the first time you know, we saw Justin Bieber uh, wear one of our pieces and we were like, whoa, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And I remember the next day we were walking down the street in the arts district and we saw this kid wearing one of our shirts. Um, in like, the wild. Like a $560 shirt, skateboarding down the street, sweating in it, got it all messed up and just living in it. Yes. And just this random kid who we don't know, you know what I mean? No mm -hmm. stylist involved, no nothing. 
he picked up that shirt. It had a just release, so we know that he he bought that full price, and he was living in it. Say word, bro. And we were like, wow. I think that was very early on in the brand before we were really seeing kind of like more random people wearing it. Mm. And I think for us, like, it's really all about the people that can appreciate it. Um, we don't like, you know, like we don't really go on sale that often. We don't do things like Black Friday and everything like that. So the people who buy our clothes, the people who have our clothes, same thing. And I learned this from you. We don't gift any of our stuff. Uh, every, anything that people see on a celebrity or anything like that, they bought it. Mm hmm. Uh, or they're renting it. <laughs> mm -hmm. or, the, or they're renting it. <laughs> yeah. And um, because yeah. Yeah. because the, peop the, the celebrities, like you said, they value the stuff a lot more if they purchase it. And so I think for me, it's really somebody who thought that this thing was worthwhile enough to spend the money on and then really appreciates it and lives in it. Like that's that's our ideal ideal client. In terms of somebody that we want to partner with and work with, um, I mean, I think that question has become a lot more complicated. Um, well, you know what? Don't give anything proprietary away. No, it's no, always no, best no. to just let people see stuff. Yeah, there's so many things I'm working on that I would love to share, but yeah. like, no, nah, I, ju I just want people to see it. Yeah, just see it. I think we are. So, I mean, touching back to what we were talking to uh, a little bit about before, um, before we started recording, like we obviously have some collaborations coming down the pipeline, um, with some different footwear brands. And I think that that is an awesome thing to us because I think that gives us more opportunity to reach a wider audience. We're still pretty niche, but mm -hmm. part of like what we're, uh, I think, trying to do, this goes back to what we were talking about with what Virgil you're doing. Too. You're not trying. Yeah. Well, you're in business, bro. You're an LLC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what we're doing is, um, so this past year, we also like redesigned our logo. Mm. So one of the reasons we redesigned mm. our logo was because um, we had this awesome uh a uh, uh, graphic artist who uh, his forte is in typography. His name's Ray Masaki. Mm -hmm. He wrote this awesome book called Why is a Salary Man Holding a Surfboard? And that was a book, a bilingual book, an English and Japanese book that he wrote and self-published in Japan to explain to Japanese people uh, what was going on with BLM in the United States. Oh, wow. Because a lot of the people uh, in Japan, obviously, it's a much more insular culture. They don't, they're a little bit disconnected to, to what was going on there. And mm -hmm. Um, he he wrote this amazing book. So he's number one. He's super super talented. Uh, number two, he, what he came to us is he looked at our old logo and he was like, "Oh, like why'd you choose this? Why'd you choose that?" And then he was like, "Man, I'd be really interested to see knowing your guys' background and what you guys are trying to communicate. I'd be very fascinated to see what would your guys' logo look like in the language of the diaspora, of your diaspora, right? Or, wow." Of the diaspora, or and, and I would say like our diaspora again. This speaks, I think, I think a lot right. to also like to to like. I, I know Kissy. I think I talked to him a little bit about this, like to also um, Black Americans as well too, right? Because hmm. your ancestors aren't from here, you know. Absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> you guys yeah. are part of the diaspora, yes, in the same way that we are as well too. And so, and, and actually, technically, European Americans are too in their own way. So this mm. is this is not to um, to to shove any anybody out, but it's to to recognize he was like, what what the ways that we are trying to communicate ideas of luxury, the way that we're trying to uh, communicate ideas of quality, were really based on a lot of Western communication of of Western standards for what looks good or what is usually used when you have something that's expensive or something that's nice. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm curious to try to engage. And it's not talking about just taking like Asian letter forms, right? But it's about, okay, when you have Eastern letter forms that come into a Western context, how do they exist? Right. And then how do they draw their value? So one of the first things is, and this is getting really nerdy, but for the logo, he put the logo into a monotype which is a kind of equidistant spacing of the different letters. Because mm -hmm. usually for Eastern characters, they're all in monotype. So even the way that these Western letter forms have to sit in a space is being dictated by the East instead of the East being dictated by the West. Wow. So um, that, like, that's just like the tip of the iceberg in terms of like what he was doing with this. But um, also like a lot of that type was particularly inspired off of 
um, the kinds of letters that you see when you walk around in Chinatowns and stuff like that in all the different cities in the U.S. And the kind of letters that you see at the karaoke or you see on a menu or in a window and stuff like that. A lot of times when they're typing English, it's still formatted to the Eastern characters that they usually type with. So that's why it comes out a little bit funky and you see it. But when you see it, you recognize it. You know that you've seen that type already. Right. So, but it's this whole idea of like, how do we redefine, how do we redefine our existence not according to someone else's value system, right? And I think it also comes down to, again, it's not about a rejection uh, or, or, all, or just centering on a singular kind of ethnicity. Inclusive. But that is the beauty of the world is that we are different. We do come from different places. So like the, so the, the goal of Good Fight has always been how do we bring different people to the same table so that they can share? And how can we learn from each other and not lose ourselves, mm-hmm. but learn things from each other? Correct. And um, I think that's ultimately like what we hope that we can do with the brand you know we hope that people from different ethnicities different cultures different upbringings different age groups can come and through the love of a certain kind of thing which like that's the magic of food that's the magic of music can be able to come together and maybe sit in spaces where ordinarily they would never rub shoulders with somebody else right and going back to your question about the pandemic that's what I feel like I learned the pandemic. That's amazing. Like that's wow. w- that's what we lost. We lost the, op- the connectivity. The connectivity. Like that was like I mean, I remember. It was so I was I was so upset coming out of the pand or coming out of the pandemic when we thought we were coming out of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. You had all these different brands that were talking about, oh, well, we want to go party now, and we want to go this. We want to be out because we were all inside. First of all. Any of us who's working, we were busting our ass. We were not Correct. sitting at home watching Netflix. Not number at all. One. Not at all. <laughs> number two. Um, number two. Um, I'm like, do you guys realize what you lost? You didn't. You didn't lose. I mean, yeah, you lost the opportunity to go to the club. Like that's a microcosm of what you lost. What we lost was the opportunity to bump into a complete stranger in a public space and be able to speak face to face with that individual. To maybe even embrace that individual Correct. without having to think about it. Correct. Like oh, all man. the times that you get to sit in a restaurant and somebody else has got something and you're like, yo, what is that? You start talking, strike up a conversation. One of my closest friends now, he's from Berlin. We met him in Japan when me and Christina were on um, our honeymoon. We were in Japan and we were going around different shops. We always see this German guy walking around in the same shops that we were at. Then we get on the flight to fly back to LA. He's sitting right next to us. Wow. And I'm like, hey, did you, were you in Pool Aoyama or XYZ, these different stores? Turns out he was actually going to see some of our friends in LA. And the reason we, one of the reasons we kept on seeing him was because he got lost and he looked at us and he was like, those guys look like they're going to the same spot that I'm going to. Wow. So let me just follow those guys and wow. I'll probably find it. Wow. But that chance encounter gave me one of my closest friends now. This wow. guy from Berlin who um, we would have no other reason to talk. But it turns out we have shared interests. Going turns out we have place. shared people. Turns out, but at the same time also, his upbringing is vastly different from mine. Mm. His culture is vastly different from mine. And I am so hungry to, to learn about what he's learned in his life. Ironically, he's also traveled like crazy too. I think he's in Tokyo right now. He was just in Bali. Wow. So he's traveling throughout Asia and through different countries all, all the time. He has an agency, so he's hopping around all the time. But it's things like that. Like those little things are the things that, that we lost, that opportunity to stand shoulder to shoulder. And, 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 I, and, and that, I think even in BLM, that was when we also re- rediscovered that too. It was like, you know what? I'm not so scared of dying mm. that I can't get out to the streets and stand up. For mm-hmm. what's right. For what's, I mean, like blatantly wrong. Yeah. Three questions for you. And these are machine rapid gunfire questions. Mm-hmm. Advice to a young professional. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. What would you share with your younger self? Don't be afraid to make mis- Don't be afraid to make mistakes and try more things. Wow. Last question of the afternoon. How do you find peace of mind? Mm. 
Yeah. That's like a pillow that you just jumped on. I saw it in your face. Yeah. Yeah. It's my wife. Hey, man. Um, hey, man. Yeah. Wow. My wife, too. Shout out to <laughs> Moni. Yeah. Shout out to Moni. Yeah. I think, you know, you know, I heard like people love to preach sermons about like happiness and joy and how there's a difference and everything like that. I don't know about all that. It's It's tough. Life is crazy. Sometimes you're happy. Sometimes you're sad. It's a constant struggle. There's no stasis. I think any time that we're trying to fight for something that's forever, a utopia, or a place with no more sadness, et cetera, et cetera, like, I don't know if that exists. But we all find home. We all find love in a certain place. And um, for me, like, that's my wife. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, what else is going on? Yeah. You know, like, you know, if I have her, you know, um, and I know that that some people don't believe in that because they're like, oh, that's not lasting. That doesn't last forever. Yeah, I know, like, it is temporary. I and mean, that's what makes it so precious. And that's what makes me sometimes I'm like eating dinner with her. And I just look at her and I'm like, man, like, let me. And that's why that's why I stepped off IG. I'm not against social media. I deactivated right. it. I didn't delete my account. But I'm off of IG because I was like, let me capture this moment. Yeah. Like what would it be like if if what would it be like if 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 God forbid one of our loved ones passed away and we were able to go back in time and spend time with them? Mm. Like how would how would we treat them then? Right? right? You see movies about that shit all the time. Right. But you know what? That shit could be reality. Yeah. In a second. In a second. So yeah, absolutely. When I'm with the people that I love, I try to step back all the time to be like, okay, let me be here. Present. Present. Let me be present. Yeah. Let me savor this moment. Cause I know if 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 I it doesn't work like that. I'm not gonna go back in time and be able to recapture anything. So let me cherish it now like I'm not going to have it tomorrow because that's, you don't know. You know what I mean? I mean, look at look at everything we're living in right now. Right. Look at, you know, uh, prayers up for Damar Hamlin, you know, yeah. of the Buffalo Bills. Absolutely, Who's, who's, yeah. who's in recovery right field. now. Yeah. yeah, like, you don't know. We don't know. Um, and so that's, that's my, that's, that's where I find, find peace. peace. That's where I find peace. Yeah. I truly appreciate your wisdom, your spirit intellect i want to thank you for pulling up brother and just sharing some sage wisdom this is the measurables powered by revolt shot by my brother cali vision see you next time peace you start the fire.